Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nancy Birdsall. I'm delighted to be the chair of the Strategy and Program Council of the IFPRI Board. The strategy, and to be welcoming you to this event, it's co-sponsored with the IFPRI staff and the amazing people who work in communications, especially. Um, the Strategy and Program Council has always sponsored as part of its meeting, a seminar on a substantive issue of importance to the IFPRI board and to the IFPRI itself. I'm going to go straight now to Yost Twinin. He will be introducing a very special person who was the chair of the IFPRI board until about two years ago, I believe, and whose idea having this particular event featuring Pascal Ami talking about trade and food. So over to you, Yo. Thank you very much, Nancy. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's a very great pleasure for me to be introducing uh, this virtual event here. Even, even in a virtual world, it's, it's a great pleasure not being together. Trade and trade policy are, uh, are hugely important issues for global food security, for nutrition, for poverty reduction. And so they are also very important areas for IFPRI research and activities. Trade issues have been central to global food security and nutrition for centuries, even millennia. Now, the specific issues which were on top of the policy agenda have, of course, fluctuated over time. I recall that agricultural trade uh, policy discussions were central to what was then called the GATT negotiations and what later became the, the WTO in the 1980s and the 1990s with many countries uh, uh, particularly developing countries, but also exporting countries, pointing at the distortionary effect of many of the rich countries having high uh, policy interventions in agriculture and food markets. Uh, this led to major reforms of OECD agriculture policies, particularly in the EU, I would say. And our main speaker, Pascal Lamy, was then the Commissioner for Trade in the EU, and he played a very important role on this before he moved on to become the Director General of the WTO. If I recall well, I think Joe Glauber, who is another speaker on the panel today, played an important role on the US side in these negotiations as well. So he also has a long history in, in trade uh, issues. I will leave it up to, to Mary to introduce Pascal. Uh, just want to point out that more recently, particularly in the food price crisis in, in the late 2000s and now with COVID-19, trade policy interventions have become, were again central to much of the policy discussions. And uh, I am pleased to say that IFPRI researchers really played an important role, I think, together with their uh, colleagues and other international uh, organizations in pointing out some of the detrimental effects of uh, trade policies and contributed, I think, in uh, removing some of the, the most, uh, the worst effects in the past uh, year. Uh, the team where Joe and, and Valeria Pinheiro are part of our MTID team has played also an important role in measuring impacts of of, uh, trade and trade policies on global food uh, prices, uh, security, etc. We have a stellar lineup here today, and uh, I'm actually going to give them the time rather than using it up. I am extremely pleased that Mari, Mari Pangestu, is uh, chairing this, as Nancy said already. Mari is currently the Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnership at the World Bank. She has an enormous CV. Uh, let me, so I will take probably half of the time if I just have to go over it. Uh, let me just point out that she was uh, Indonesia's Minister of Trade for almost a decade from 2004 to 2011. Uh, I will really recommend you to take a look at her bio to see her very important, uh, not just policy, but also academic contributions. Uh, let me end on by saying that Mari was the chair of the IFRI Board of Trustees until recently, one of her activities, I'm not going to say achievements because I'm not, I don't want to, was uh, she was in charge of hiring me as director general, but she also left the board by the time I started as director general. So this gives a bit of mixed signals, I think, in her trust in me taking this forward. With that, Mary, it's really great pleasure to have you here, and I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Nancy, for your initiative to organize this event, and I'm I wouldn't have missed this uh, program uh, if you had not even invited me. 
Um, and I'm glad we're finally doing it after discussing it since last year. And thank you, Yo, for your kind introduction and also uh, introducing IFPRI's work on trade, food security, uh, and environment. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Pascal Lamy, who actually needs no introduction. Uh, having been a thought leader and policymaker in trade and international issues, both at the global level and for Europe. I have known Pascal uh, with his many reincarnations, but as, many, as Minister of Trade, I interacted closely with him in his position as the European Trade Commissioner, uh, and then later as the Director General for the WTO from 2004 to 2013. And since then, uh, Pascal has led many initiatives, such as the Paris Peace Forum. And somehow or rather, he always gets me involved. So I'm also uh, sitting in the steering committee of the Paris Peace Forum. And uh, he also sits on many boards, most importantly, being on the board of IFPRI and a member of IFPRI's uh, strategy and uh, program council. Uh, and as Nancy and I discussed last year, we wanted to, to get Pascal uh, to speak about the, the interrelationship between trade, the multilateral trading system, and how it interfaces with SDGs. Uh, and, uh, and I guess uh, with today's attention on climate change, I also hope that uh, Pascal will be able to start, uh, discuss the, um, the issues of the day, as, as they say, and, and put it in the context this, uh, the context of today's uh, challenges um, that we all face. So uh, without further delay, let me uh, give the floor to Pascal uh, to start us off with his keynote uh, remarks. Pascal, over to you. I have to unmute myself. Uh, thanks very much uh, for these uh, introductions, uh, Nancy. Uh, Yo, uh, Marie, the great thing about being introduced by friends is that uh, there's no risk. They always are nice. Uh, so thanks for that. Let me now turn to my uh, remarks, which will introduce our discussions, starting with a bit of uh, memory. July uh, 2008, Geneva. Uh, in the early morning, uh, the U.S. rejected a special safeguard clause, uh, which had been tabled to unlock the agreement that we needed at that time to move the round forward. Uh, the rejection by the U.S. of the special AG safeguard clause uh, was the straw that uh, broke the door around uh, Camelback. We are now 30 years later, and in a nutshell, agriculture is uh, nowhere to be seen in the WTO big agenda. So what was a major issue 13 years ago has now quasi disappeared from the WTO agenda. So what happened? Uh, has uh, trade in agriculture become uh, irrelevant? No. Have uh, soldiers all left the battlefield? No. So, what has happened? Well, I think uh, Jo Swinnon uh, would answer this question very simply, as I do it in saying uh, it's the political economy stupid. That's where a lot has changed. Not all, which will be my first point, but a lot, which will be my second point, hence the necessity of a new agri-food uh, international agenda, uh, which will be my uh, third point. Now, starting with what has not changed, I think is uh, the complex relationship uh, between agriculture, uh, food, and uh, international trade. And this complexity has for a long time stemmed from a tension between one side and another side. On one side, uh, the reality and the economic science that uh, 
tells that open markets uh, remain essential for food security, for food availability, for food affordability, hence the necessity to keep permanently addressing obstacles to trade in order to diminish them, if possible, remove them. That's the sort of pro-open trade side of the equation. But there's another side, uh, which is, uh, stems from the fact that uh, economics of trade opening, uh, which work according to economic theory and practice, uh, work differently in uh, agriculture and food. In a way, and to put it very simply, given the short time I have, uh, the benefits of comparative advantage are less obvious in agriculture than elsewhere. There are many reasons to that. Land, which is the working capital, uh, is not mobile. Uh, weather can change. Uh, Socio-cultural specificities on the uh, production side, uh, the huge importance of uh, rural employment, a number of specificities linked to demand, diet habits, you don't consume uh, food uh, you wear, uh, you consume uh, shirts or socks. Uh, the result of all this being that overall, agriculture and food are more protected trade-wide by tariffs, by subsidies, and these are, as we all know, equivalent in many ways than uh, the rest of production and notably manufactured. Overall, and I haven't checked the numbers recently, uh, agriculture and food are twice as much trade protected as manufacturers or other goods. So this has not changed, it's still there. What has changed, which is quite a lot, uh, and which make uh, this relationship even more complex than in the past, is uh, a series of uh, factors or realities. Let me briefly list uh, what, in my view, are the other shaping factors than the one I just mentioned, which have changed and which have gained importance. Uh, I can see four of them. Environment externalities, attention to the impact of uh, food production on CO2 emissions, on biodiversity, on soils, on the hydrosphere, are now much more in the picture than in the past. Uh, the second one is that uh, we have the other way around problem, which is that agriculture uh, is a victim of global uh, warming, which induces a series of changes and visions we have in the sector. The third one is the higher importance given to nutrition, its quality, not just its quantity, its relationship to health, uh, sugar, uh, fats, the role of nutrition in uh, non-communicable diseases, for instance, and that has a lot of impact, notably in the Northern uh, Hemisphere. Uh, culture has also changed. We now have vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, animal welfare or uh, meat uh, among a young generation a mental, a symbolic attitude, uh, which has nothing to do with what it was 10 or 15 years ago. And finally, and that's a major shaping factor, tech, biotech, breeding, uh, the use of uh, GPS, uh, bioreactors. Uh, I'm not going to insist on that because a lot of these changes stem from uh, hard work uh, which was produced in the meantime, uh, by many uh, CGIR uh, centers. So these factors are very different overall than what they were uh, 15 years ago. And the reality which 
also has changed a lot, is that uh, support to farming and food as a trade distortion uh, in many ways has lost a lot of importance. The main structural reason for that is that in the meantime, long-term food and agricultural prices have uh, trended up. And the basic reason for that is the nutritional transition that accompanies growth, development, uh, GNP per head, and that basically moves food structurally away from staples into less proteinic uh, yielded uh, ways of uh, getting food. Uh, and we have, as a fact, and this was evidenced by an impressive set of numbers which uh, uh, Rob Voss uh, gave last week at the last uh, SPC uh, meeting at FPRI. Uh, we have roughly now today 600 billion of uh, ag and food support in the world, the majority of which is now provided by developing countries which is something that would have seemed totally unlikely 15 years ago. And by the way, uh, Rob's number, if I remember well, is that among uh, these uh, 600 billion uh, ag support, uh, roughly one third is China. Again, a major reshuffling of the players and of uh, the way things uh, happen. So all in all, a different political economy of this relationship uh, between uh, agri-food systems and international trade. And I think one of the main features of that is that what is now considered is the whole of the agri-food system. The relative super importance of farm, what happens on farm gate as compared to the whole of the system, uh, has uh, diminished. And we all know that, roughly speaking, uh, uh, the GNP stemming from this sector uh, is, uh, let's say, 100 from agriculture, and you have to add another 50 to get to the whole food chain from uh, farm uh, to fork. So this leads, and that's my uh, final point, uh, I believe, uh, to uh, what we should build as a sort of new agri-food uh, trade agenda, where the basic idea uh, is that uh, focus should shift from uh, protection to precaution. What I mean by protection is uh, when you protect uh, your producers from foreign competition, this is protection, in some way, protectionism. What I mean by precaution is when you protect your people from risk. This is precaution, and this is somehow precautionism. Not that these things, which are fundamentally different in their purpose, do not have some sort of connection. There is, as we all know, and as all trade wants know, there is a gray zone uh, between uh, protection and precaution, which is when precaution is used for protection purposes. But let's leave that aside. And it's in a reasonable purview from the WTO system. I think we now have to look more at the consequences of growing precautionism and less at the consequences of a relatively diminishing uh, protectionism. And this I should, should translate uh, into a few new headlines for a global uh, conversation on uh, agri-food. Uh, the first one would be uh, to revisit the pros and cons of food and farm support, considering what in the old days we Europeans uh, uh, used to call the multifunctionality of agriculture, the sort of looking at the whole farm to fork, including environmental externalities or health impact. Uh, and this is a way to look again, looking at 
what sort of support is legitimate or not, works or not. And this is the whole work of what was about uh, repurposing uh, support to farm and drawing the necessary consequences of this in terms of welfare about trade measures. The second one, I think, uh, should be uh, about establishing a sort of new platform, a new forum, a new table, probably, in my view, in the WTO, uh, for uh, comparing, discussing uh, environment or other precautionary measures, a sort of expansion of a committee where members of WTO would compare, change, uh, listen to each other, try to harmonize, mutually recognize, or discuss how to handle uh, measures like uh, CBAM, uh, the carbon uh, border adjustment, or its equivalent for soil. And I believe there will be an equivalent uh, to uh, CBAM uh, in agriculture uh, for soil in, uh, in the near future, looking at the water footprint, for instance, there should be a place where all these externalities along the agri-food value chain are looked uh, together. And I think the third thing uh, which uh, we should do uh, is to devote uh, much more resources on uh, standards, on harmonization, on certification. The real north-south issue in the future, in my view, is not about protection, but about precaution given that the one that holds the level of precaution that matters, which is the highest one, which de facto is imposed on others, is uh, for the moment on the North. And this, of course, necessitates to go uh, beyond uh, the WTO uh, SPS, including in the area of uh, aid for trade, with a sort of a much bigger sort of aid for trade versus a big uh, Codex Alimentarius, uh, regrouping uh, FAO, uh, WTO, uh, the uh, International uh, Animal Health, uh, and, the F and, and the WHO, for instance. I think we need something of a new setting of this kind. So that's where I believe these uh, evolving factors uh, shaping trade in agriculture lead us in terms of a new trade agenda. Uh, and my uh, concluding sentence, as could be expected, uh, would be that this is a full plate for the trade experts, uh, the trade division of the uh, IFPRI for the years ahead, assuming, assuming, of course, but this is another story, IFPRI uh, survives uh, the uh, one CGIR reform. Thanks for your attention. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, as usual, to the force uh, uh, and outlining the new political economy uh, and the context in which uh, we are uh, discussing the issues around uh, food, uh, not just agriculture, but the food system from farm to fork. Uh, and how uh, it must be leading to a new trade agenda, as you said, and the, the elements of the new trade agenda. So I uh, need to uh, introduce myself uh, again now as the, as the moderator um, and, uh, and, and remind everybody that um, uh, all of you can participate uh, in, in the question and answer. Uh, I, I think it's hashtag ask if pre uh, you can um, participate in our Q&A that will follow the, the presenter's remarks. So I will make some remarks and then there will be two discussions. Please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag ask if pre on Twitter. Uh, so ask if pre all capital letters. So let me uh, now uh, just make a few remarks before I ask uh, the other presenters uh, to come in. Uh, I, let me just make uh, three points uh, very briefly. Uh, first, that trade is important to address food security. 
uh, I think uh, what we are do, what IFPRI is doing and what the World Bank is doing uh, does focus a lot of that. And uh, with COVID, we have seen uh, that urgent sustained action is needed to address increased risk of food insecurity and to prevent widespread famine. COVID-19 uh, has more than doubled the number of people facing hunger, reaching 290 million as of April 2021. Our household surveys uh, show that uh, it is not the access of food which is an issue, it's the drop in income and people are eating less and women are, have been more uh, impacted. And 35, 34 million uh, in, of people in 16 countries will be at risk uh, of experiencing famine. And this is expected to be exacerbated due to climate change. And uh, Pascal also mentioned this. I think it's not just access to food, but um, you know, moving ahead, access to nutritious food uh, will be a big issue. And high food prices uh, will be uh, uh, having a big impact on food importing countries. Already a hard press uh, uh, with the slow recovery uh, in incomes across much of the world. Uh, even though the World Bank's agriculture, agriculture commodity price index has st stabilized in recent weeks, it remains uh, at a six year high level. So keeping trade open will be still central, I believe, to addressing food insecurity and supporting recovery from the COVID crisis. Uh, so this is the, the, the traditional uh, trade issues are still uh, important as we grapple with the new trade issues that uh, Pascal, uh, the new trade agenda that Pascal uh, emphasized. Uh, and this, it, the good news is that uh, food production is adequate uh, for now, uh, and the fear of increased uh, export restrictions uh, have been averted last year. Uh, in fact, the number shows that liberalization efforts of 42 billion in agriculture trade exceeded export curbs affecting 39 billion of trade. However, I think we still need to be vigilant. In early 2021, we saw signs of backsliding with Argentina, EU, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Ukraine putting trade restrictions in place. Uh, so we need to still uh, watch out so that we don't have the food spi price spikes that happened in 2008. And just two uh, recommendations to avert this, increasing uh, information transparency and monitoring. So policymakers need the data and information to access, assess the risks and what they should be doing. So an early warning system that will lead to early, hopefully early action and decisions to be made by trade. Uh, what, what needs to be imported to ensure sufficient supply is, is key. And uh, the World Bank and uh, IFPRI are working uh, on this. And also the G20 uh, agriculture market information systems has also helped policymakers to have better information uh, as to how, what they should be doing and we think have tempered the use of export restrictions on food during COVID. And moving ahead, I think will also help inform policymakers as to what uh, Pascal mentioned as good policy uh, in agriculture and food systems. Second, increase cooperation on trade issues that are critical for food security. Last year, the G20 agreed that such export restrictions on food and as well as health products should be targeted, proportionate, transparent, and temporary. We know this um, is, is very difficult uh, in reality, uh, but the WTO uh, should be involved in monitoring these measures um, and we need to continue uh, to monitor these issues. Second, trade will be key to reducing price volatility due to product production disruptions caused by climate change and delivering food supplies to countries, especially those that are extremely vulnerable. For example, two vulnerable countries where climate change is expected to affect crop productivity are Malawi and the DRC, where they could uh, experience a GDP uh, dropping by significantly if uh, they are not uh, being assisted uh, and not being able to import uh, the, the amounts of food that they need. Trade is also critical to climate change adaptation, which in turn strengthens the food security capacities of communities. I think improving access to critical inputs and uh, fertilizers and machinery is constrained in low-income countries by a range of tariffs and non-tariff measures. And this is where uh, I think uh, Pascal's uh, issue about the uh, having an effective systems of standards, uh, which has been a major barrier to cross-border trade uh, and regional fertilizer markets is important. Trade liberalization hopefully will address some of this. And I do think the issue, the whole issue of uh, agriculture support and uh, fertilizer subsidies also needs to be discussed 
in that context as well. Finally, trade policy essential is essential in getting climate change, climate policy right. Additional liberalization of trade in agriculture products can help reduce food waste and could also help address food insecurity. Uh, FAO estimates that about 30% of global food production is lost each year due to inefficient logistics and delays at the border and in ports. To address that, this is it's important to support countries with um, enhancing uh, trade facilitation of agriculture products, investments in better transport and logistics, and a reduction in non-tariff barriers related to uh, SPS requirements. And I think uh, what Pascal emphasized as the precautionary standards will also be play a very important part uh, of, of the whole uh, this, uh, value chain of um, uh, food, food systems and uh, agriculture. And, uh, I, and the, the steps being taken now, uh, complementary action on climate change that's being taken, such as carbon pricing, is intended to achieve uh, the triple goals of growth, food security, and reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, many countries are introducing carbon policies that will ensure goods are produced with their carbon, where their carbon footprint is the smallest. An example of the inefficiencies from a carbon emission perspective is the production of dairy in the desert. Uh, some of Middle East countries are doing this, which requires energy intensive air conditioned farms. That's an example of um, uh, a not good use uh, of, of your, if it, it may be efficient, but uh, imagine the, the carbon footprint. Uh, so as uh, I agree totally with P Pascal that all these um, precautionary as well as uh, in the name of cl uh, climate change and addressing uh, incentives that are needed uh, for, for carbon, that we need to all have a discussion on this and there has to be an agreement on how these um, things are measured and in terms of uh, carbon pricing, carbon measurements and pricing and how cross-border carbon taxes will be impl implemented as they, this will all have an be an impact on trade. So th those are just my brief uh, three points that I'd like to um, uh, share with you uh, from my, I guess, trade and development uh, perspective. Now, let me invite uh, the, the next two discussants. We have Valeria uh, Pinero, Research Coordinator uh, from IFPRI. Uh, you have the floor, uh, Valerie. Valeria. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here today and to have the opportunity to comment on Pascal's work. He has been working on the key issue of the nexus between trade and the environment for the last 15 years or even more, um, bringing a clear analysis of the relationship as well as the policy implications. So today, I just want to highlight on four uh, ideas around the role of trade in contributing to food security, environmental sustainability, and healthy diets that relates directly with the work uh, we have been doing here at IFPRI and that Pascal just uh, mentioned. Um, and I think also that um, this is very important these days where COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the importance of a robust and resilient food system that functions in, high, uh, in all circumstances that is also capable of ensuring access to affordable food. It has also highlighted the interrelationships between health, ecosystems, supply chains, consumption preferences, and more than anything, the planetary boundaries. And at a time where it's even more relevant to think of strategies that will prepare us to deal with the management of the pandemic, the recovery from it, as well as future crisis. So I just want to go with the first one, which is that the 2030 agenda calls on all countries to use trade to create a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient world. For this, we need to stop thinking of the environment and trade as isolated issues. Instead, we must align trade and trade policies with environmental and social objectives. The global trading system should actively contribute to eliminating environmentally harmful practices while promoting innovative solutions and reducing tariffs and non-tariff barriers on the import and export of green products. It is also important to think of trade policies that connect sustainable production with sustainable consumption and promote a broader shift that helps consumers to make better choices. And the second one, it is that reforming farm policies or repurposing them, but with a clear objective of sustainability. And again, here I mean uh, social, economic, and environmental in a WTO compatible way. 
inform international policy options will improve on current less efficient unilateral policies like the sugar taxes and nutrition labeling and carbon taxes that it has been already mentioned today, which often yield a less than optimal result from both country level and international perspective. The third one is that if production increases, greenhouse gas emissions will definitely increase as well. So trade plays a role in allowing countries to exploit their comparative advantages. In this case, allowing production to switch in countries with lower carbon intensity. This will be the result in a perfect world with no externalities. However, in the real world, we have to think about the true cost of food that accounts for market failures affecting the environment, public health, and the economy. Costing these impacts caused by production practices can contribute to climate change mitigation by reducing crop and livestock emissions, sequestering carbon in soil, and decreasing emissions uh, intensity. Proper costing can also enable improvement of public health outcomes by changing the balance of what foods we produce and consume. However, there are many complexities in the food system footprints that cover uh, multiple domains, again, the environment, the economic, and the social. And there are heterogeneous footprints between countries and have different impacts depending on where the production or consumption is done. How is it value in that country and the trade-offs that may arise in a particular context? Dealing with market failures that cross borders requires a multilateral coordination and collaboration. And the last point I would like to uh, highlight again from Pascal's comments is that how can we promote or include the environmental objective into trade negotiations? Or how can trade be part of the solution? And for this, this allows to reason in just what I mentioned before about the true cost of food. There is a need for agreeing on what the objective or the consequences we want to obtain and then making sure it's attainable by designing the proper policies, incentives, innovation and adoption by all countries and stakeholders. This is done at a local, national and international level, highlighting the importance to be consistent. So for example, the green of trade uh, uh, policies is in a national level, for example, the farm to fork in the EU, bilateral level, the EU, EU and Mercosur trade agreement with the inclusion of the chapter on trade and sustainable development and a multilateral uh, level, like the discussion of the harmful fisheries uh, subsidies. Um, so, as Pascal said in one of his research articles, I would like to leave you with that message. It is a multilateral approach to climate change that centers on collective action is absolutely key. Thank you very much, and I will leave you with Joe Glover. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. The next discussant is jo Joseph Glover, Senior Research Fellow uh, from IFPRI. Uh, you have the floor, Joe. Thanks very much, Mari. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. I, these are people I, I've worked with uh, a, a lot, um, uh, certainly Pascal and Mari in 2007-2008, when there were serious efforts to get a trade agreement in the door round. And uh, it's tough to be a discussant following my colleague, Valeria, who's, who she always sets the bar high uh, with her insights. Um, it's been about 13 years, as Pascal mentioned at the, at the outset, um, since members failed to get an agreement uh, in the door round in 2008. And um, I, I think, thankfully, there was much salvage in subsequent ministerials, uh, notably the end of export subsidies and uh, uh, agreement on the, to get the trade facilitation agreement, um, which I think is uh, proving to be, a, as many had, had uh, hoped, uh, something that will really aid trade in developing countries. But much was left behind. And I think part of the problem of harvesting the low hanging fruit is that it's made it more difficult to get progress in other areas. So market access, domestic support, safeguards, cotton, all those issues that were uh, on the table back in 2008 in a comprehensive agreement now look a lot like the, the real difficult issues are still there. A lot of the, the, the easier ones uh, uh, ha have been harvested. And I think uh, you know, what we've seen since 2008 is also the fact that, that many countries have gone uh, down the bilateral route or, or the uh, setting up regional trade agreements 
which have increased market access. And I think that's one of the big things that, that certainly uh, 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 gave incentives to enter into new agreements with, with uh, individual countries. But those market access gains have come ex at the expense of multilateral, uh, a multilateral agreement. And moreover, there's a lot of people, uh, particularly developing countries that are on the outside looking in. That is, they're not parties to these um, uh, regional trade agreements. So they've, they've uh, had, um, uh, are not reaping the full benefits of those things. And uh, oftentimes we see bilateral agreements and, and these regional agreements imposing standards that sometimes uh, that are at odds with other trading blocks. So things like GIs, for example, or sustainability uh, conditions as was mentioned by Valeria. Um, and, and that also imposes costs on developing countries because they end up having to choose between, well, should we start with, rather than having two separate processes, should we, um, you know, what are we gonna do here? And I think this is uh, alludes to the spaghetti bowl that, that uh, Bhagwati had warned against, um, uh, but creates real difficulties. And I think that it speaks to the fact that these, it's so important for many of these issues actually to be resolved at the multilateral uh, uh, level. Lastly, there's a whole host of issues that have were, were issues back in 2008, but it had become larger issues, public stockholding, export restrictions. Um, we've seen that both with the food price crisis, but then also with, more recently with COVID. But I think there's a real opportunity, as alluded to by Pascal, for um, uh, even coming up here with the uh, uh, ministerial uh, later this year at MC12 to make a, a start in addressing these challenges. Uh, again, urgencies like COVID, climate change present challenges to the global trading system that uh, are best met through multilateral uh, negotiations. These are things that Yes, you can treat some of these through uh, um, you know, bilateral trade agreements, uh, regional trade agreements, but to address things like subsidies and other things, those really have to be done at the multilateral level. Um, I, the, the recent trade wars have made it all the more, uh, uh, made us realize all the more that the, the world functions much, much better when the system's working rather than when it's not. Um, and, and lastly, this is a former trade negotiator. I think part of the part of the problem is, is that we there's often tendencies to pocket any concessions when we're when we're negotiating with others, and and so you just ask for more. We tend to undervalue the benefits of trade agreements and or of of trade offers and and over uh, overstate the costs. And I think that's difficult because you're not only negotiating with those on the other side of the table with you, but you're also uh, negotiating with those behind you, that is your domestic producers and consumers and others uh, back in the country to, to, to get them. Uh, you, you also have to sell an agreement with them as well. Uh, I think uh, work with my colleagues at IFRI, Antoine Bouet and David Laborde show the value of reducing tariff bindings, even if the reductions in applied rates is not nearly so great. And that was a big complaint during the Doha round is that there just wasn't much market access, even though the tariff cuts on bound levels were quite high. What, what, what and Laborde show is that members can always reverse themselves, always rate tariff uh, uh, levels up to the bindings. And so any sort of reduction in that so-called water actually has great, uh, great benefit. And I would, uh, the last thing I would say is that also, uh, if you look at domestic support, uh, if you look at the, what was on the table in 2008, uh, I think many people felt those were insu insufficient, but yet you look at what's happened as, as alluded to by Pascal over the last 13 years and levels of support are much, much higher. I look in the case of the US where uh, levels over in 2019, 2020 are probably three to four to even close to five times the level of what was agreed to uh, or what was on the table, at least in, in 2008. So I would hope that, that when members do return to the table, and I think these are multilateral issues that need to be resolved, that they look at, at what's on the table with a careful consideration of what the costs of not coming to an agreement are. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, reminding us the importance of the multilateral approach uh, when we come to subsidies and many of the other issues that we talked about. 
Uh, Pascal mentioned 2008 uh, when we were negotiating Doha and the special safeguards and the special products of which I guess I was very involved. And I, I recall another event, uh, Pascal, I think it would have been 2007 when we had probably the first trade and environment uh, ministers meeting uh, in Bali uh, in, uh, uh, on the fringes, on the periphery of the COP, uh, UNFCC COP meeting in Bali. And I think that set off a discussion which we haven't completed till today. Uh, but I, I, you know, uh, these are some of the major issues that we have been discussing uh, for many years. Uh, Pascal, um, you uh, let me invite you to just respond uh, to the uh, comments uh, that have just uh, been made by myself, by Valeria, by Joe, before I open it up uh, to the floor for uh, questions, further questions. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, very shortly. Uh, one, I uh, agree very much with the point you made about uh, export restrictions. Uh, this is a sort of classical trade negotiator's issue. But we all know uh, that whereas there are uh, a relatively sophisticated system uh, to control import restrictions, uh, there's not much in terms of global rules on export restrictions. I think we need something like this in the ag and food, although it's more about establishing some sort of, in my view, reverse safeguard, something which is uh, temporary, which may be necessary to avoid domestic price uh, to shoot up in case uh, there is a scarcity on uh, world markets. So agree on this point. And second, uh, I also agree very much with what I saw at the an underlying uh, thought to your remark, which is that there is a big role for the World Bank, aid for trade, development assistance in general, in order to help developing countries, cautioning the inevitable impact on their comparative advantage of the rise in precaution. If it's about protection, you can always have a variable geometry. I will have a zero tariff uh, for roses from Rwanda, a 15% from uh, Costa Rica, and a 30% uh, from Israel, uh, because Rwanda is poorer than Costa Rica, which is poorer than Israel. If it's about the maximum pesticide residues I administer at my border, there is zero difference between Rwanda, Costa Rica, and Israel. Forget the special and differential treatment in the world of precaution. I don't like this reality for many reasons, like most of you, but I think we have to face it. And this necessitates a sort of repurposing, reordering of the priorities of aid for trade in order to help developing countries matching the standards, which by the way, is also something which if they develop, they will have to do uh, for their own sake. Uh, on Valeria's remarks, uh, totally agree that uh, if we had a sort of a true cost of food, a good chunk of this debate about agriculture, food and trade would be much clearer. Not least because it would re-establish the real starting point, which is what is a good agri-food system for the world, which leaves room to comparative advantage, which leaves room to innovation. And then once you have a reasonable picture of this, how can trade facilitate this and not handicap it, which I think is, uh, is uh, the way this soon, uh, should be looked at. Uh, add uh, Joe, uh, which I totally, uh, I use this occasion, Joe, we haven't seen each other for a bit of time. Uh, and I want to use this sort of public occasion uh, to sort of uh, exonerate you. Uh, and I don't ask you to agree or disagree uh, from uh, this episode of 2008. Uh, I might write someday uh, on the US side uh, who was pushing on the right side and who was not. And if I ever dare to do that, uh, I beg uh, you'll be on the right side. 
this, this being said, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I totally agree with this notion that bilateral trade agreements are a problem for multilateral trade agreements. Uh, I've always looked at this in a very pragmatic way. I'm a big fan of the uh, Chinese proverb that says that uh, don't mind the color of the cat provided it catches mice. And whether it's a bilateral agreement or a multilateral agreement that catches obstacle to trade, let's, let's have it. Uh, while recognizing that anyhow on subsidization, if there is still an issue with subsidization, it can only be multilateral. As we all know, there's no bilateral chicken or multilateral chicken. A chicken is a chicken. Uh, whereas, whereas if it's about tariffs, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, different. Uh, finally, uh, still on uh, Joe's uh, remarks, one of the main reasons why tariffs have decreased and where market access on agriculture has increased is not because of trade. It's because of the upward trend of food prices. We had a period before 08 when food prices were on the structural decline, so in terms of trade were on the wrong side for producers of food and ag, uh, it has changed things. And one of the reasons why so many tariffs have decreased is that lot, lots of governments have decreased their import tariffs to keep uh, the price of food uh, reasonably for poor people. So uh, it has, in my view, more to do with this nutritional transition and the impact it has on long-term uh, ag prices uh, than uh, on agriculture. But I stand ready uh, to be uh, contradicted uh, by numbers. And uh, IFRI is the place where I would look for numbers. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal, uh, for those responses. Uh, let me now uh, turn to uh, the question and answer. Uh, just as a reminder, we would like to hear from all of you and uh, please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to give the first question to Nancy Bertzol, uh, also a board member and chair uh, of IFPRI Strategy and Program Council. She's asking Pascal and others on the panel, please give the rich countries a score on the food agriculture sustainability nexus relative to the ideal. Compare US score to China uh, and the EU. You can trust Nancy to ask difficult questions. So <laughs> uh, uh, Pascal, would you like to start taking a crack at that question? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I would say, uh, and I'm ashamed to say this as European, I would say one EU, two US, uh, three China. Uh, one EU, uh, not that the EU farm policy has gone uh, fast enough, in my view, in the direction of this new agenda uh, which we discussed and which I basically understand we all agree, although, although, the way EU has decoupled farm support and the way it is starting to move uh, towards uh, costing better uh, the externalities of food in uh, production and more to come in the coming month and in the coming years, I think still uh, put them uh, in the lead, uh, at least, at least if you look at the sort of long term intentions. Uh, I think US, for obvious reasons, are not yet there. It's also true that in the US system, uh, the sort of large, big crop uh, producers uh, whose impact on environment and health, water consumption and so on, this lobby is incredibly powerful. Uh, and I'm, uh, again, uh, in the presence of Joe Glauber, I'm, uh, I'm admirative that he's still alive. Uh, given uh, what the US government sometimes had to push back on this lobby. And remember that having 
two senators for Montana and two senators for California is a big coefficient of this. Uh, China, I think, is only entering into this, uh, into this field. Uh, the reality is that uh, environment and uh, partly health are the two areas uh, where China, apart from uh, political issues, has made uh, mistakes uh, for the last uh, 50 years. They overall did not make any mistake, hence this incredible performance of, uh, of growing uh, their economy with the social consequences of this, uh, which for most of them are positive. But it's clear that uh, environment and health are not the strong points uh, which, uh, where they have scored. I think they are slowly entering into this, not least uh, uh, because uh, the government feels that the Chinese population is now much more sensitive to that. So that's my score, short answer to Nancy's question. Valeria or Joe, would you like to come in? Joe? Sure. sure. Um, I, I, I think that, that um, it, it, what you find is that a lot of the issues like greenhouse gas emissions or environmental impacts, those will vary a lot. And, and so you can eliminate you know, you may find a country like the U.S. is very efficient on greenhouse gas emissions in the sense that per unit output or whatever may be much more efficient than, say, in another country. Um, the other point I would say is that that subsidies actually contribute. Uh, they they obviously some subsidies are worse than others, and those tied to production or tied to input use tend to have a, a bigger impact on things like the environment or things like uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the overall impact of getting rid of those subsidies is not quite as large as I think many people assume. And I think that, that I think it is a good, um, uh, it's an important effort to try to repurpose subsidies, but I don't think it's a panacea in and of itself. Agriculture emits a lot, of greenhouse gases, it will with or without subsidies. Um, and so I think those things are important things to, to bear in mind. And nutritional outcomes, uh, ag subsidies are very, very crude ways of trying to, to shape nutritional out outcomes. Um, so let me, let me stop there. And Mary, can I just add one, one last thing and uh, just to complement a little bit, I think that also, what it is different is the modalities in which countries are doing the things. So even the uh, the European Union is doing it one way, and the EU for and the United States has a different modality on how to deal with those things. So I think that here it's a very good moment to remind us again how important it is to um, collaborate and harmonize and have an, a common objective between everyone, because whatever we're going to be doing in the developed countries also, will reflect on the path that developing countries will be doing shortly. So all these things that Joe just mentioned about repurposing, it is good, but we really need to understand what do we mean by repurposing? How are we going to do it? Uh, people understand uh, the word repurposing in many different ways. And when people hear, for example, that there are $600 billion in support, as uh, Rob Boss said the other day, and Pascal just uh, uh, said, um, we have to really look in what that means and where that support is going right now, like if it is in the inputs or the outputs, couple, the couple, all these things that Joe just mentioned. But we really need to understand what's the impact of those things and what it is the clear objective we want to get at the end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Valeria. Uh, let me now turn to the questions that have come in uh, from the floor. I will uh, uh, bundle a couple of questions that are related to uh, Pascal's precautionary approach. Uh, for Pascal, uh, it's from an anonymous. <laughs> Your precautionary approach would be interpreted to be encouraging, encouraging EU views of GMOs. I doubt that's what you mean, uh, but uh, please uh, clarify. And then another question from uh, anonymous uh, for Pascal, uh, Mr. Lamy. How is a precautionary approach consistent with WTO existing rules? Example, the evidence-based uh, principle uh, in the SPS uh, agreements. And then Ben from Ben VD from EC, how can environmental border protection in trade be made compatible with 
WTO rules. It's, it's part of the, I guess, precaution uh, besides um, the health and uh, uh, safety reasons, the, the, the environmental reasons are also uh, coming in. So uh, Pascal, would you like to respond to those questions? Yeah. Uh, first, on GMs, uh, I think uh, the EU reluctance uh, to GM uh, started as a case where protection and precaution uh, were mixed uh, with each other. And I remember that full well at the time uh, when the EU had uh, mountains of uh, butter or meat or lakes of milk and the notion that you should boost the productivity of these animals uh, looked a bit weird. Uh, there is a part of that but it has now morphed into something different and I think GM, uh, whether you like them or not, as a fact the EU stance is a precursor of what I call precautionism, uh, with its good sides and its bad sides. It's like protection. I mean, uh, uh, protection uh, may have its virtues. Protectionism does not have. It's a bit the same like precaution. Uh, it, it has to be used. And the reality is that for whatever anthropological reason, historical reason, uh, the uh, EU is on a higher level of precaution uh, than the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, overall, the US are quite similar, Japan not far. Uh, and this is an issue which uh, we have to look on uh, both sides. It has good sides. If it's about protecting the environment, precaution is a good thing. It's, if it's about uh, taking uh, two or three months more than uh, normal developed countries to have its population vaccinated, uh, this is not the good side of precautionism in the in the EU. On uh, on uh, the SPS agreement in WTO, uh, I think if you bundle the text of the SPS and the interpretation of the SPS agreement by the appellate body, uh, you come to a reasonable balance uh, between uh, the necessity to protect your population from risk and the fact that this may translate into obstacle to trade. There are principles of uh, uh, evidence uh, based with a margin of precaution of comparing uh, the size of the obstacle to trade to the risk you uh, pretend uh, you cover, the sort of proportionality, transparency. So all in all, uh, I believe that uh, the existing SPS agreement plus the interpretation of the appellate body translate into a reasonable balance between uh, protection and uh, precaution. Lastly, uh, on uh, CBAM, uh, as you may know, uh, I co-authored uh, with uh, my friends at Europe Jacques Delors, which is the third sister of the Institut Jacques Delors. There's one in Paris, one in Berlin. One was born in uh, Brussels last year, which devotes its focus on sustainability and European integration. We've published a series of briefs, uh, which you can find on uh, europejacquesdelorsoneworld.com on how to green EU trade policy, including a template of a CBAM, which uh, until now, an another one will appear in the weeks to come, with Antina was the only template that was on the market, uh, which uh, gave, lot to, uh, gave rise to a lot of discussions. Uh, there are ways to make a carbon uh, border adjustment uh, compatible uh, with uh, WTO rules. The main, the main condition, and I'm not going to enter into details, is to make sure uh, you do not discriminate uh, your imports as per your domestic production, i.e. you do not impose to your imported production a uh, higher uh, carbon uh, emission price than what you do uh, for your domestic. And this not only implies 
which is a big problem uh, for a number of big industries in the EU. This uh, implies the disappearance of uh, free allocations. If you equalize the price of carbon at the border, and remember the EU price of carbon should be around 100 euro uh, 10 or 15 years from now, uh, starting from where it is now, which is roughly 40 to 45 euros, which is the highest price uh, on the planet. Uh, then if you equalize uh, your carbon price at the border, uh, you have to stop uh, subsidizing uh, your industry uh, with free allocations. More into the papers which we've uh, published, uh, which uh, run into all the details of the necessity to make an EU uh, border carbon uh, mechanism compatible with WTO. Otherwise, it's not going to be uh, voted neither by uh, the Senate of Member States nor by the House of uh, Representatives of the European Parliament. Over to you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Pascal. Uh, let me uh, now turn to uh, uh, another uh, question. Uh, it's related to Africa. There are two questions related to Africa. How is the Africa free trade conti continental area likely to impact the national, regional, and global agricultural food systems and uh, trade dynamics? Um, and then there, that was from Albert Lenny Otieno. And another question uh, from uh, Aceres Mamo, <clears throat> Ethiopia. Trade restrictions for African products and farmers is high. How can uh, African farmers be treated fairly in global markets? Uh, and I guess within that, what, what would be the role of a regional uh, free trade agreement uh, like the AFs, AFTA, AFTCA? So, uh, Pascal, and uh, if any of the other panelists also want to <clears throat> respond, uh, I would welcome that too. So, Pascal? Uh, I, I, I think I should share the responses with my uh, colleagues around the panel. Uh, on, the, on the African uh, continent of free trade area, uh, I'm working on this, trying to help it happen. Uh, let's be frank, it's a very, very long-term prospect. Today, uh, the amount of border restrictions in uh, Africa, uh, whether it's about agriculture or the rest, uh, is enormous. And to be very frank, uh, what's missing in this African uh, free trade, uh, continental free trade area, the only single thing missing is that you have to get rid of borders. So the notion that 50 plus African countries will negotiate progressively by addressing each of their tariff lines of continental free trade agreement will not work. My view is that you've got to take the thing the other way around. You have to decide that by 10 or 15 years from now, borders will have disappeared and that this is true for goods, this is true for services, this is true for people, this is true for capital. And then you move back from such an endeavor, what needs to be done, and notably uh, in agriculture, which is a very tough area to liberalize in agriculture uh, in Africa, uh, not least because this will entail some sort of specialization uh, which, of course, uh, is uh, politically and socially uh, a very difficult process. So my answer to this is that if Africans are serious about a continental uh, open trade system, uh, they have to start from the end point and then move back to what needs to be done now and not start like we do it usually from where you are and then little by little, millimeter by millimeter, centimeter from centimeter open trade. Uh, on, on trade restrictions for uh, African products, uh, let's be frank, uh, most of the trade restrictions for African products are not tariff barriers. They are not tariff barriers. They are not related to protection. They are related to precaution. And this uh, takes uh, my answer back 
to the point I made in uh, commenting uh, Mary's uh, point, uh, what Africa should do as a continent in the global conversation is push for global standards that they can reach after some sort of scheduled process and a lot of technology and money transfer uh, to upgrade uh, the uh, precautionary uh, standards which they have to match if they want to export uh, to other continents, which they will have to do given the enormous potential comparative advantage uh, which Africa has in agriculture, provided it fixes a number of its uh, infrastructural problems, uh, starting, of course, with uh, water and uh, irrigation. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Joe or Valeria, did anyone, Joe, you would like to come in? Yeah, go sure. Ahead. And I, if, if Valeria wants to go first, she can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, I would agree that, that obviously the costs of trade are very, very high in Africa. We, we know the, uh, uh, just the cost of doing business and moving across borders, uh, not just tariffs, but non-tariff barriers as well, uh, even things like infrastructure. So, uh, you know, the, the cost of moving, moving something from say Bamako to uh, Accra or some other area, they're just very, very high. It, we don't even measure trade very well. So much of the trade goes through via informal trade. Uh, we have some work going on uh, at IFPRI on that, uh, very, very important. But I would agree with um, Pascal, I think the way to do it is to set some sort of endpoint in terms of where you wanna be in terms of tariff measures and, and move towards that. I think uh, doing a, a number of, of requests and offer type things just is really complicates it given the, 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 the extent of the number of members, et cetera, uh, in the free trade uh, area. Um, the, the other thing I would agree wholeheartedly on, and it gets back to my uh, one of the points I made in my, my comments, was that, that I think these are issues, things like standards are issues that really need to be uh, resolved globally. And, and um, it's less, uh, I, I think, Pascal, it's less that I'm against free trade agreements because I think they do uh, perform, much like you say, a very important role. Um, but the, for things like standards, I think it is really important to try to get some global agreement there. And I think for countries like Africa, I think you do need to, to give some lead in period and, and trade facilitation and those sorts of things where you can help uh, uh, you know, uh, enable those countries to um, uh, you know, get standards up so that they can enter into the, the value chain uh, in Europe and US and other, other uh, large importing countries. Valeria, did you have anything to add? Uh, nothing really new, Maria. I just wanted to emphasize the, 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 the role that uh, informal trade has in, in Africa. Uh, I think that that is important. And also the problem with trade facilitation uh, for Africa. I think that um, a big investment should be done in that, in that sense. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to add that <clears throat> the World Bank has uh, obviously been working a lot to support the AFTCA and, uh, and you know, there are uh, obviously a, a lot of uh, work to be done there, but we do try to work also at the sub-regional level uh, and, and, and look at, you know, where cross-border uh, trade can happen and how to facilitate that. And one area we're working on is in the Sahel region. Uh, and this is a, like a comprehensive approach because it's a very vulnerable region. How do you combine the infrastructure needs with the food security needs with climate change and, reduce, and increasing resilience? So uh, I think uh, this, these are some of the issues on the ground that does need a lot of uh, capacity building and focusing on, on the priorities uh, of the region to ensure- Mary, Mary, I, yes. Mary, I think yes. your Sweden wants to step in on Oh yeah, okay, Joe, Joe, do you want to come in? The other Joe, <laughs> <laughs> <And> Joe's. <laughs> <Right>. Well, <clears throat> it's related to the point of, of standards and precautions. So if, if that fits in here, the, <clears throat> 
I mean, the, the, I think I very much agree with the statement which what many people have made here is that the, the role of standards is, is, is growing and is becoming more important than, than the, the tariff barriers, I think, for the future. And I think this will increase, okay? If you, think, if you look at the food systems analysis where we're looking at environmental impacts, nutrition impacts, et cetera, all these things will somehow come into, uh, or at least have the serious capacity or the... Uh, to come in through the discussion or the trade effects through through standards in a broad way. Now, on, on the precaution principle there, there's some really interesting work done by um, an economist in at the University of Berkeley, David Vogel, okay, and he has analyzed in great detail the <clears throat> some of the precautionary uh, attitudes in the US and in, in Europe, and he shows that the current uh, view that Europe is a much bigger user of precautionary principle than the US, that's relatively new and that if you go look in the 1970s and the 1980s, it was actually the other way around and precaution was much more used in the US than, than it has in Europe. And so he described, he gives a number of reasons for them. One was the, the Reagan government, which really had a very liberal attitude towards regulation, which really shifted the political attitude. and. And at that point, that's really when GM technology came forward. And I think GM has a much bigger impact on uh, precaution and, and standards than just the GM, but changing the whole attitude, I think, particularly in Europe, for example. Essentially, in Europe, nobody was in favor of GM. If you look at the big lobby groups, except the scientists, okay? So the big, uh, if you look at the companies and then the, the sectors in the US, which were in favor, which is part of the input industries, those in Europe were very much, they liked to make the money basically selling pesticides, et cetera. So they didn't need GM. And so there was not big lobby uh, in favor of it. The point is that once you install precaution, okay, what you see is that consumers adjust their behavior or some regulations attitude to the precaution. Consumers change their behavior in terms of consumption patterns, Companies change their behavior because they make investments consistent with the regulations which have been introduced. And that in, in a dynamic way changes the political and the social attitudes of a country or a region vis-a-vis -vis these, these things. And so that way, food standards have typically long lasting effects on these things way beyond the moment that they were introduced. Um, let me leave it at that, thank you. I think what you've just raised and what Pascal and, and uh, others have raised is becoming, a, I guess, an important issue that we need to discuss. And there is a question actually uh, from Ikatut Budastra uh, asking uh, the question, you know, so where, we, we know that these uh, precautionary standards are important, but where, where does all this get decided? Could WTO make a collaborative effort with FAO, FAO and WHO to enhance food security, food safety, and food sustainability globally. So it, it's sort of the bigger, the big question uh, 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 that uh, we, we will end up having precautionary standards. How does that this get determined? How, how do, to make sure that developing countries um, uh, are part of the conversation to, uh, to this creation of standards? And how do you make it evidence-based, transparent, et cetera, et cetera? You know, how, how do we, where do these conversations, uh, how and who uh, would these conversations uh, happen? Do you end up having a codex for environmental measures for agri-food systems? That was another question from Charlotte Heberbrand. Um, and, and so those are, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I, I would like to hear uh, all of your views uh, on that. And uh, I agree with Pascal that, you know, we are in the stage where we, it's, it's moving in that direction. When we, when we are working with developing countries, uh, how do we make sure that they can be uh, part of the conversation when these standard settings are happening uh, and also help with them with capacity building technology and repurposing uh, subsidies to get them uh, to that space because otherwise they will be hurt um, uh, in, 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 the, in the medium run or even in the short run if, if uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, border adjustment taxes will be introduced by Europe in 2023. Uh, they, for instance, they need to be ready, right? And uh, and how do you, you know, our conversation back in 2007, how do you prevent that from becoming the precautionary standards becoming disguised protection? Uh, so that's that's a whole lot of um, uh, issues that I put on the table, but any, any of you, uh, maybe start with Pascal, if you want to respond. No, of course. Uh, I, 
and I, I think I alluded to this in my remark, we need a sort of big food codex. We have a small codex alimentarius, uh, which uh, pinpoints here and there things which have been done. But it's, it's a bit like, you know, a huge ocean, and there is a small archipelago, which is called Codex Alimentarius. We need a whole land in order to do that. And I think this inevitably is the way to go. What I left open in my remarks was that whether or not this should be done in the WTO. Now, there are obvious reasons for having this in the WTO. Uh, because A, it's a better convening table than FAO or, uh, uh, or even uh, WHO. Uh, second, there is a sort of habit of disciplining and discussing notification. And there is an SPS committee that works in reality extremely well. Nobody knows what happens in the SPS committee, but I can tell you, <laughs> having watched the SPS committee work uh, week by week, month by month, during eight years, there's a formidable work of de facto coordination, which is happening at this, at this level. So there is a sort of expertise uh, which uh, is there. And when you have expertise somewhere in the international system, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Now, the side against having this in WTO is that WTO is a forum for negotiating reductions of obstacle to trade. And this sort of obstacle to trade is not for negotiation. The risk in putting this in WTO will be that people will say, ah, 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 these diplomats are going to start trading off my cherished level of precaution. Uh, they are going to make money with my health. They are going to decide what's good or bad for my pets. I don't want trade negotiators to do that. So if we have to go in the direction, which I believe, there's a big sort of carpet bombing <laughs> preparation to be said that this is the way to go and why it is the way to go and why it should be there. And by the way, and this will be the end of my question, this is what both US and EU totally missed when they launched the TTIP. If you look at where, and Joe knows that better than anybody, if you look at where on ag can you open trade transatlantic, 80% of the answer is in harmonizing standards of precaution. Chlorinated poultry, GMO, and the rest. The problem being that when they launched this negotiation, they gave the impression that they would be negotiating this. I will take uh, your chlorinated poultry and you take my GMO, or I will take your this. Or, and of course, it never worked like that. It cannot work like this. This is politically impossible. So yes to the notion that we have to move in this direction and that this is absolutely crucial for developing countries not to lose a comparative advantage which they have in producing food. And this is essential for the future. But in a, in a nutshell, that's the way to go. But we need a plan on how to go there. So, okay, so I hear that you uh, think the lead should be in the WTO, but that the major uh, members like EU and the US need to, to play a lead and then how to make sure that you know, others uh, come on board, including other international organizations. Joe, did you wanna come in on this? Actually, I was gonna let Valeria say something Valeria, first. Valeria, okay, Valeria. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I should always say Valeria and Joe. <laughs> I actually really like the way uh, Pascal just finished answering that question, which is we need a plan. <laughs> so <laughs> that is the key here. So when we think about um, standards, it is clearly that if we agree on what we want to have, it is better and is the best and most efficient way in terms of uh, thinking it globally. So for example, I don't know, the um, food labeling. If we want to do each country do their own food labeling, 
it will cost a lot of money if you want them to export your your uh, goods somewhere else. You need to change the package and send it and all that stuff. So if we agree on something and and it's just everybody agreeing science-based and all that, it will be a better world for everyone. So I think that what we need is it's a plan. I do believe as well that the WTO is the right institutions to do it just because the codex works perfectly. And as Pascal just said, the SPS, everything works. So it will be the right path uh, to, to go through, through that, just extending it to cover the environmental issues. Thank you. Yeah, the, the only thing I was going to add, and I think that uh, Pascal ended with, with saying it, I, I was, it was just the difficulty of these negotiations. If you think about uh, getting all countries together, I, Pascal's absolutely right. If, if the EU and the US have a hard time getting together, agreeing on, on pretty much anything. I think if you looked what was going on at T with TTIP, the, the tariffs could have been negotiated probably in a week, but the rest of it, very, very difficult. And um, uh, and that's those problems are only going to get multiplied internationally, and and all the issues like special and differential treatment and all those things come up, and, and I think will be a very problematic. The one thing I was going to add though on this it doesn't really matter in one sense. Private standards are moving along, and so you still have essentially uh, with what countries are are doing or what what individual companies are doing are imposing uh, pa uh, patterns and standards that are determined or you know uh, causing developing countries and others to react and again it, it makes sense to do this in a, um, uh, a global context or multilateral context it makes it, uh, it it should be done with with other agencies like fao and and bringing in as pascal met, uh, talked about increasing the, the 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 scope of codex or whatever but uh, a very 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 difficult task uh, thank you. I'm afraid we have to wrap up. We've got about four minutes uh, left, if I'm not mistaken. We uh, have, we, have, we were uh, due to have a one and a half hour session. Um, I just want to, um, I had one unanswered question, but so if uh, Pascal can just give us a one minute, uh, one minute answer to where does he think the, the next WTO ministerial uh, will prioritize and, and what are the burning issues that we need to uh, to address in the in the next WTO ministerial, uh, not necessarily just in the food uh, security, food and ag uh, agriculture area, because if we want uh, a plan that WTO uh, will will uh, enforce, then uh, there needs to be a continued relevance of the WTO. Just very briefly, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a one minute billion dollar question. <laughs> Uh, as I said in my introduction, it's not about food or agriculture, where we need to reconstruct a full-fledged agenda. Uh, I think uh, short-term, the real thing that can be decided if there is political will is this agreement on fish subsidies, uh, which is not a great thing, but which would put WTO at last in the picture of uh, greening our world, and that would be a good signal, although in economic terms, uh, that's not a big shot. And for the rest, uh, it's about uh, the conversation which we need, first and foremost, between US, EU and China, or let's say EU, EU, EU US on the one side and China on the other side, on uh, how to restore uh, competitive neutrality uh, with China. The reality being that uh, global market capitalism, whether you like it or not, necessitates a sort of level playing field in the way you use your state to run your economy. And that uh, China has, uh, unfortunately, diverge from a stream of convergence, which uh, it, where it was when it joined WTO. And uh, my basic stance on this is that either China will move towards accepting some sort of competitive neutrality disciplines or the sort of open trade 
uh, which China has benefited from uh, for the last uh, 40 years uh, is over. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, it's, I need to close our really great discussion today uh, with a big thanks uh, to, to everybody, especially to Pascal and of course to Valeria, uh, Joe and Joe uh, and, and Nancy uh, for uh, today's really great discussion. And to all of you who participated with the questions um, and discussion, actually a lot of the questions uh, that I didn't mention uh, I, I were actually uh, also addressed by your, by your comments. I just want to make uh, two concluding, two or three concluding remarks. One is that I think we all we are all in agreement that while that we are addressing the new uh, agenda that needs to be addressed, the traditional issues of trade, like export restrictions on food and agriculture, the non-tariff barriers that still exist, that actually uh, hurt can hurt uh, especially vulnerable and developing countries with food price hikes and and so on needs to still be addressed at the national bilateral as well as uh, regional and uh, uh, multilateral level. I think that's still an ongoing um, agenda, unfortunately. Uh, second, that we do need to take a holistic uh, view uh, when we look at agriculture. It's not just about the farm production, but it's farm to table. Uh, so it's agricultural and the whole food system and, and about the health and nutrition aspects and the climate change. Uh, and, and that's an, it, you have once you look at it in a more integrated and holistic way, then you can start thinking. Uh, and, you, and this is what we are doing at the bank, helping countries uh, take that that perspective. How do what what how do you design your policies and how do you uh, repurpose your your subsidies? Not eliminate your subsidies, but repurpose your subsidies to be more effective, uh, to to be uh, having what we call smart uh, and sustainable uh, agriculture and food systems. And I'm happy to say that we are working quite closely with IFPRI uh, on these various issues at the country level and at the regional level. And then finally, on the new uh, trade uh, agenda ahead of us, especially that affects uh, food and uh, agriculture, the whole discussion about precautionary has been, uh, I think, very enlightening. And uh, agree with Valeria, we need a plan. <laughs> And uh, this, is, this is going to be the continued discussion uh, ahead. And uh, I think from a development perspective, obviously, um, and, and what jo Joe uh, Swinnon mentioned, it, it's, got, it's already happened and it's happening because of consumer behavior. It's not governments that are deciding this. So, uh, you know, exporters, companies realize this, but how do we make sure that this is not going to be done in an ad hoc way? is where we need a plan uh, to make sure that there is an agreement on uh, what these standards are. And, and they are going to be, I guess, sector by sector. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, that's how Europe plans to do it. You need to do it sector by sector. You need to agree on the standards. You need to have it transparent, evidence-based uh, because, uh, and, and developing countries need to be a part of that uh, discussion uh, because they are going to be impacted. And how do we have the, the capacity building, the technology, um, and uh, helping them to come up with the sustainable production and uh, trade and distribution that they need to be able to continue to be participating uh, in, in, in world trade. I think that's uh, really one of the big uh, issues that, that we are also working with at the bank. And we, we look forward to continued discussion on this because it will be an ongoing discussion. And uh, today was a good kickoff uh, and very enlightening discussion on, on, the, on the way ahead. So let me close with a big thanks uh, to everybody and, uh, and thank you all uh, for, for participating uh, and uh, the audience for joining us today. I invite you to join IFPRI on Tuesday, May 4th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time uh, for another yet uh, seminar, uh, CGIR COVID-19 Hub Seminar. COVID-19 and implica implications for One Health research. Something that we didn't discuss too much today, but that's a very, very uh, important uh, topic. So uh, let me close uh, with, a, with a virtual applause <laughs> to all of you, uh, speakers, uh, discussants, uh, as well as the audience. Thank you. Thank you all uh, and have a good day. <laughs>